Good morning, folks, and welcome to my Bible study class. The title for our class is Made for a Purpose. And uh, the key verse is coming from the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 2, verse 10, okay? For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Hallelujah! Uh, we're going to sing a worship song next. And y'all can join with me if you'd like. And it's been pre-recorded, okay? So here goes. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights still I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind. To me, and oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Yeah. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Thank you for that love. <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you and we praise you for that reckless love. For while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Thank you that you chose us even from before the foundations of the world. And Father, that is just so mind-boggling. But we're so grateful for what you did at Calvary. We're so grateful for the death, burial, and resurrection of your son, Jesus at Calvary, Father, where all our sins were forgiven. And not only that, Father, you took Jesus' perfectly perfect righteousness 
and credited it to our account. Thank you that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so, Father, we praise you. We worship you. We magnify your name, Lord. Thank you that you are Jehovah Shalom, the Lord God, our peace. And you've told us not to be anxious about anything, but by prayers, with supplications, and with thanksgiving, to make our requests known unto God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds by Christ Jesus, Father. Thank you that you are in complete control of every situation and every circumstance in our life. Thank you, Father, that the very hairs on our head are numbered by you, that we're the apple of your eye, that you've engraved us in the palms of your hand, that the thoughts you think towards us are more numerous than the grains of sand in the sea. And so, Father, we come to you this morning for our Bible study, Lord. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord. Guard my mouth and my tongue to say only those things that are edifying and glorifying to you, Father. And help me to proclaim the truth, but proclaim it in love, Father. And Lord, I pray for the special anointing of your Holy Spirit that makes preaching and teaching such a pleasure. We ask it in Jesus' matchless name. Amen and amen. All right, so let's go to the introduction of our class. Our God is the God of purpose. He uniquely designed and created everything in the beginning to accomplish his will in its specialized way. Nothing he has done or will do is by accident. Amen? And, and that's why it's so important to discover the will of God, the purpose of God for our life. Okay? Uh, of course, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. But we have to discover the purpose for which He has created us and then try to fulfill that purpose. That is where we can find the most amount of satisfaction in Him. Hallelujah! <laughs> Uh, note the orderliness and progressiveness of his creative activity. Step by step, God spoke into being everything necessary for the subsistence of humans, the apex of his creation. On the third day, he contained the waters and caused dry land to appear as the prerequisite for plant and animal life. He then filled the earth with multiple seed-producing vegetation to provide food for future human and animal life to inhabit the world. On the following successive days, he set the stage for creating humanity. He ordered days and seasons for planting and harvesting living creatures in the sky and seas, living creatures on land as food and domestic life sources. Hallelujah! The creation of man and woman was not an afterthought, <laughs> but the intentional result of his will, his good pleasure. God crafted them for the purpose of glorifying and worshiping him in his presence forever. Unfortunately, sin delayed yet did not derail the fulfillment of humanity's God-given purpose. We must be thankful that the promised seed of the woman, the Redeemer, came to reconcile and provide the opportunity to realize God's purpose 
for created humankind. See Genesis 3 and 15. So let's look at what Genesis 3 and 15 says. Uh, and I'm reading from the NIV. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Amen. It's talking about the serpent, which is Satan. <laughs> uh, and God says that uh, 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 Jesus is going to crush his head uh, while he will uh, strike his heel. Amen. <laughs> uh, remember, he was nailed to the cross. Ah, okay. So let's go on. Now, everyone who comes to God by faith in his Son has a divine purpose for living to glorify him through works of righteousness and demonstrate his, superior, his supreme love and graciousness to others. Did you hear that? This is so awesome. Now, everyone who comes to God by faith in his Son has a divine purpose for living to glorify him through works of righteousness and demonstrate his supreme love and graciousness to others. Wow. All right. Uh, next, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the biblical context. Um, in Ephesians 1, Paul demonstrated that all believers already possess every spiritual blessing that they will ever need to live the Christian life. See Ephesians 1 and 3. Uh, and we've studied all those scriptures the previous two weeks, so I'm not going to read all of them because it, it would take a lot of time. Uh, I will include them in my notes and you all can read them there, okay? These blessings are the result of the sovereign election of the Father. See chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. The Son's redemption, okay, uh, chapter 1, verses 7 through 12, and the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Aha! See chapter 1, 13 through 14. All for God's glory. Isn't that wonderful that he chose us? He redeemed us. He bought us back from the slave block of sin, huh? which is redemption. And then he sealed us with his Holy Spirit. He put his mark on us, the Holy Spirit. All for God's glory. Ah, notice that. It's all for God's glory. It's not for my glory. It's not for someone else's glory. It's for God's glory. Then, like the loving leader he was, Paul prayed that these believers would come to know God intimately. Chapter 1, verses 17 through 18. So that they would understand the hope of their calling. Uh, see chapter 1, verse 18b. Their value to God in Christ. Uh, chapter 1, 18c. And the incomplete terrible power of God's of God manifested through Christ and readily accessible to them chapter 119 through 23 <clears throat> and all these scriptures I've read we've discussed in the previous two classes okay in Ephesians 2 1 through 10 which is our present uh, uh, <clears throat> Bible study Paul explains Humanity's previous state, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, clarifies the meaning of salvation, chapter 2, 4 through 7, and identifies God's divine purpose for the redeemed, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Hallelujah. Uh, let's go to the analysis of the biblical text. And uh, point number one is, talks about what we were, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, okay? 
So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. All right? So here is chapter 2, 1 through 3. What we were. This is what we were before we got saved, before we had salvation. Here's verse 1, and I'm reading from the NIV. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who, now, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That's talking about Satan, the prince and power of the air. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Amen? Uh, all right, let's go on. Uh, verse 3. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Huh? And, and so we used to live at one time gratifying the cravings of the flesh. The Bible tells, talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Ah, hallelujah. Those are the things that Satan uses to destroy us, to tempt us, to seduce us. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. This is talking about pre-salvation, before we got saved, before I got saved. Amen? Okay, so let's, let's go to these scriptures and kind of look at them in greater detail. All right? Uh, and let's, let's see. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul wrote that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen? Uh, Romans 3 and 23 from the NIV says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen? Notice what it says. It says all have sinned. It doesn't say y'all have sinned. Okay? It says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, all right? And then... Um, Romans 6 and 23 says, 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? The wages of sin, the payment for sin is death. Now what is that death talking about? It's talking about eternal separation from God is talking about actually hell instead of heaven. Amen? Uh, so, uh, eternal separation from God. Um, Ephesians 2 offers a compelling explanation of what sin is and why it is identified as a form of death. Amen? Because sin completely separates us from God. Uh, here Paul clarifies humanity's inescapable and desperate need for salvation through Christ. Because remember, uh, before we got saved, we were all living uh, to fulfill the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And by nature, we were deserving the wrath of God. The judgment of God. Uh, eternal separation from God. Amen? Um, and remember that uh, it, the Bible says it's once appointed for man to die. And after that, the judgment. Hallelujah! Amen? Uh, the Bible doesn't talk about reincarnation. <laughs> doesn't talk about we die and then we come back as another life form and then we go through these endless cycles of reincarnation and ultimately we become one with the Atma. <laughs> Baloney! 
Bible says it's appointed once for man to die and after that the judgment. When we die as human beings, we'll have to stand before a holy and pure God and have to give an account for our lives. And that is why Jesus had to die on the cross, shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins so that we could make it to heaven. Hallelujah! Which is for eternity. And we would escape hell, which is also for eternity. Hell is a terrible place of eternal torment forever and ever. Just as heaven is a place of eternal enjoyment with God. Just joy, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost forever and ever in heaven. All right. Um, Grammatically, verses 1 through 7 comprise one long sentence in Greek whose subject is God and the object of the verbs made, raised, and seated is us, the believers. God has made believers alive, raised them, and seated them with a son. We are seated in heavenly places by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah! That is so powerful, you all. And it says, above every principality and power, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Without Christ, every soul is spiritually dead. Ah, okay. Without Christ, every soul is spiritually dead. We were dead in our sins and trespasses, is what the Bible says, okay? Uh, Paul describes them as dead in transgressions and sins. The terms are usually synonymous, but signify unbelievers continuous involvement in sin. Ah, one preacher described those who have not accepted Christ as the walking dead. (coughs) How horrible. Existing, but not living. (coughs) Excuse me. One preacher, let me repeat that, described those who have not accepted Christ as the walking dead, existing, but not living. That's why a lot of people are walking around trying to fulfill the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and they have no satisfaction. You remember the sound? I can get no. Bum, 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 bum satisfaction because you are dead in your sins and in your trespasses amen you are simply existing you are not living if you do not have Christ in you this spiritual lifelessness is essentially the result of having no relationship with God through Christ and therefore being incapable of responding to spiritual things. Unbelievers are not dead because of sinning, but because as Adam's seed, they were born into sin. Amen? When Adam and Eve fell, uh, sin was passed on to the rest of the human race. Verse 2 further explains, their actual condition. They consistently follow the world's system of values, the cosmos, okay? The world's system of values and ways of doing things. Excuse me. In this satanically energized system, Humanity 
sets the standards for right and wrong that are opposed to God's. And isn't that what humanity tries to do? They're trying to, the atheists are trying to get rid of uh, the moral absolutes which come from the Ten Commandments. Amen? Why? Because then they can do what's right in their own eyes. And then, of course, the newest, the latest fashion is it might be right for me, but it might not be right for you. Baloney! That's what the Greek word for that is. There's no such thing. That happens when you remove the moral absolutes that God gave us. And why were those moral absolutes given? You know, most people on say believe that God was some kind of a, a heavenly, celestial killjoy. No! It was out of his love for us. He was trying to protect me from me. He was trying to protect us from us. Amen? From the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's why those Ten Commandments were given. And it wasn't because God was some kind of a cosmic killjoy trying to destroy all fun in life. In fact, I think uh, when you get saved, <laughs> after you get saved, that's when you have the most fun in life, serving Jesus. Hallelujah! That doesn't mean everything goes hunky-dory, but there is joy in your heart in whatever you do. All right. They blindly follow the leader, Satan, the ruler of the... <clears throat> kingdom of the air of this age, the evil one. Why is he called the prince and the power of the air? Because that's he has dominion right now, temporary dominion, okay? Uh, uh, he controls the atmosphere. Um, ultimately, of course, God is in control of the entire world, of the entire universe. Uh, but he just has some temporary power to cause uh, destruction and confusion. And why does God allow that? Because he wants humanity to get a chance to select, to choose right and to choose wrong. God never forces himself upon us. He gives us the freedom of choice. Amen? They blindly follow the leader, Satan, the ruler of the kingdom of the uh, heir of the sage, the evil one, the same spirit is currently working in the lives of slaves to disobedience, those with no regard for God's word and will. And that's, it's, that's why it's so funny that you, when you talk to people who, 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 who do not have a Christian perspective, they come up with all kinds of garbage and they think that that's right because that's what the world tells them. And they don't even realize that they're being indoctrinated by the things of this world. They're being affected by the culture in which they are living in. Amen? Which is, uh, which is a, a sinful culture that's divorced from God. In verse 3, Paul reminds believers that they too had once conducted themselves as son of, sons of disobedience and slaves to the world system. Ah, and just in case, if you, if you misunderstand me and think I'm so self-righteous, it's not so because I have been there, done it, and got a t-shirt. And had it not been for the grace and the mercy of God, I don't even know where I would be right now. Maybe sleeping under a bridge. Amen? It was only because of his grace and his mercy that he pulled me out of the mighty clay and set my feet upon the rock to stay. The rock of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! So I've been there, done that. <laughs> I'm not simply trying to point fingers. In verse 3, Paul reminds believers that they too had once conducted themselves as sons of disobedience and slaves to the world system. Ah, 
before accepting Christ, everyone lived to satisfy the cravings, desires, and the thoughts of the flesh. Wow. Wow. Tragically, we, become, we became candidates for God's condemning judgment without exception. Thanks be to God that this was not how the story ended because we deserve judgment, but he gave us grace and mercy instead. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't give us an elaborate set of rituals we had to go through to be accepted by him. He accepted us just as we were. Hallelujah, and changed us from the inside out. Woo! <laughs> Thanks be to God that this was not how the story ended. Now here's a question. What do you think? How does Paul's description of the unsaved help us understand how to explain the need for salvation? Ah, because that's, that's how... We all lived at one time before we got saved. And then when God saved us, he completely changed us from the inside out. And he's still transforming us into the image of his son. Hallelujah. That is so awesome. Okay? Okay? So, so, so you have to understand uh, the difference of how God brought us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. <laughs> ah, and that's why we are the way we are. <laughs> because we now have the mind of Christ. All right, let's go on. What we are, point number two, Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. So let's go to Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. Ephesians 2. Four through seven. Okay. Here we go. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7 from the NIV. What we are. Um, the first point was what we were. Now this is what we are. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah! In order, verse 7, that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This is so awesome. This is so awesome. If people could just grasp what the scriptures are saying what the scriptures are saying, how he is lavished, he's poured out his grace upon us, even though we didn't deserve it. Oh, the everlasting, never-ending, reckless grace of God, love of God, grace, reckless love of God. Wow. He, why was it reckless? Because he risked the life of his son. The most precious thing he had, he gave up. For your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the whole world. And yet the world just rejects that. It says, we don't need it. We don't want that. Oh, God. Be merciful, spare your people, Lord. Save your people.
The conjunction but signals a contrast in God's action towards the spiritually dead. And that plight in verses 1 through 3, God is the subject of this passage. But God emphasizes God's role as the source of the power of salvation. Paul describes God, the agent, as being rich in mercy and his great love as the motivation for extending unmerited favor to sinners. That's what grace is, unmerited favor, undeserved favor. We deserve judgment, but he gave us grace and mercy instead. In this passage, love is the verb form, agapao, A-G-A-P-A-O, agapeo, agapeo, meaning to seek the highest good in the one loved. The highest good in the one loved. God's undeserved kindness towards sinners is great because they have no plea or merit to make them acceptable to God. And yet the religions of the world are just trying to do that. The way I, I, I explain this to people is the religions of the world are man's attempt to reach out to God. Christianity is where God reached out to man. Big difference. There is no comparison. God's undeserved kindness to his sinners is great because they have no plea or merit to make them acceptable to God. You cannot do anything to get saved by yourself. It has to be done by God. Because of this love, God performed three things for those accepting salvation through Jesus Christ. First, he made us alive in Christ. Verse 5. God was fully aware of the believer's plight, but he gave spiritual life to the unregenerated while they were still in sin because of his grace, because of his unmerited favor, undeserved favor. The tense of saved expresses salvation's permanency due to what God did in the past on our behalf. Former unbelievers were resurrected positionally to a unique and new way of life. Additionally, God seated former unbelievers with Christ in heavenly places, verses 6b. Spiritually, believers are positioned in heaven with Christ. Excuse me. Where the true citizenship lies. Being made alive, raised into a new life, and seated positionally with exalted Christ in heaven demands living like citizenship uh, like citizens of heaven now on earth. Our character should be Christ-like and kingdom values are the only standards we should follow in our lives. Believers are without excuse for not living as God's exalted children. The same power that physically raised Christ and us spiritually is available and accessible by desiring and yielding to the Holy Spirit's ministry in our lives. He didn't leave us comfortless. He gave us the comforter. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. He gave us the guide, the parakletos, one like him, to guide us through the vicissitudes of life, 
to show us the way. The need exists for the faith community to teach about our salvation responsibilities and to hold each other accountable for understanding and practicing them. Why? Because in the eternal state, when we all get to heaven, God will feature the redeemed as exhibits of his grace. Verse 7. God freely gives new life to all who come to him by faith as an expression of his undeserved kindness. The right response of the redeemed is thanksgiving and praise paired with a holy life. Wow. And so sad to see that even some so-called Christians claim to be Christians but they're not living a holy life and they're not going to make it to heaven it's as simple as that that's why the Bible clearly talks about the falling away of people in the church people are falling away right now how sad is that to have known God at one time and yet to fall away from him? Wow. God, God forbid, God forbid. God freely gives new life to all who come to him by faith as an expression of his undeserved kindness. The right response of the redeemed is thanksgiving and praise paired with a holy life. Now here's the question. What do you think? How does an understanding of who believers are in Christ inform moving from spiritual principles to visible practice? So once we understand who we are in Christ Jesus, that we are seated in heavenly places by Christ Jesus, above every principality and power, that the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost, lives inside of us. The spirit of holiness lives inside of us. That should be enough to convince us to live a holy life. Because the Holy Spirit is continually trying to transform us into the image of his son provided we yield to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Positionally, we have been sanctified, but practically, we're being conformed into the image of his son, into the image of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go on. What we are to do. Um, point number three, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. All right, and this is again from the NIV. What we do. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So why is there so much sometimes envy and jealousy in church? God has prepared us for good works and for the kind of works that he wants us to do. God is going to fulfill it. So we don't have to fight and be envious of somebody else's gift. Or We should be happy. We should be glad 
that God can use one more person besides ourselves. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's, let's look at these scriptures uh, further on uh, in more detail, okay? Uh, let's see. Um, okay. Let's look at these scriptures in more detail. Grace by faith is the basis for God's incomparable riches. Verse 8a. There is no human effort involved in salvation other than faith. And even that is God's gift. And we need to repent, but even repentance comes from God. So it's all by Him. Amen? Verse 9 reinforces this fact. Since no one can acquire salvation by their efforts, no one can boast. Jesus completed salvation on the cross, and it is a finished work. See John 19, verse 30. Human effort has nothing at all to do with it. The only boasting that believers can do is in the Lord for all he has done for us. See Psalms 34 and 2. Let's look at Psalms 34 and 2. And I'm reading this from the King James Version. It says, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Amen? And many times when you're boasting in the Lord, people say, look at him, look at him. He's just bragging about himself. They don't understand that you're boasting in the Lord. But the humble understand where you're coming from. Ah, see, my soul shall make a boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Okay, and then 1 Corinthians 1 and 31. Therefore, as it is written, and this is from the NIV, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So we as Christians do our boasting in the Lord. Amen? It's clear. For in verse 10, introduces the reason for why Salvation is of God and not due to humanity or works. Believers are God's workmanship. <coughs> and the word workmanship is poema, P-O-I-E-M-A in the Greek. His masterpiece or work of art created by him in Jesus Christ. Do you understand that you are God's masterpiece? God's work of art created by Jesus? Uh, created by God the Father in Jesus Christ? Do you realize that? Huh? That is so wonderful. So there is no room for... Um, for self-deprecation. There's no room for low self-esteem because we get our self-esteem for who we are in Christ Jesus. And yet I find so many Christians walking around with low self-esteem. How can you be? Have low self-esteem when you're royalty. We're all kings and priests in the kingdom. That's what the Bible says. Amen? So be encouraged. Good works have nothing to do with acquiring salvation, but a great deal to do with living the Christian life. We are not saved by works, but we are saved for good works. Amen? God determined the acceptable works for those who walk with Him by faith. Verse 10b. We're not working for God. 
<clears throat> but he is accomplishing his work through us. Wow. That is powerful, y'all. We're not working for God. We're accomplishing his work through us. We're just vessels of clay. And the excellency is on the inside, is from the power of God that lives inside of us. Wow. We are earthen vessels. Here again, there is no reason to boast. It is impossible for us to manufacture good works because it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2 and 13. And sometimes we find Christians working, working, working to, to gain acceptance. But we are already accepted in Christ Jesus. Amen? So we don't work to gain acceptance with Christ. We are already accepted in the Beloved. We work because of how grateful we are for what Jesus has done for us in our lives, for what he has done in my life. We're just fulfilling his destiny for our life. Amen? It is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13. New International Version says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Amen? The visible evidence of salvation and a powerful testimony to the lost are the good works that we allow God to perform through us. There are no bench members in Christ's church, in Christ's church because every believer was made for a unique purpose according to the plan he has for their lives. Hallelujah! Here's the question. What do you think? How should knowing that God created us in Christ Jesus for good works impact the ministries we perform? It should set us free to do the things that, that, that God has ordained for us to do in our lives. You know? And so it should deliver us from envy and jealousy and strife with other believers. We shouldn't get jealous of uh, some gift that somebody else has. Amen? Because he's given each one of us gifts. Amen? All right. Um, let's go on. Here's a closing thought. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 informs us that humanity was spiritually dead and alienated from God, separated from God, and deserved his condemning wrath. But God's grace intervened and produced new life in those who accepted his plan for salvation through Christ Jesus. And sometimes when I get high, I feel like I'm high and mighty, I always remind myself, but for the grace of God, there go I. So I have nothing to brag about. Only thing I can brag about is Him. This exalted change in spiritual status carries with it the responsibility of living circumspectly in the world. As God's extraordinary masterpieces, believers are tasked with allowing Him to produce and do good works through them as proof of personal salvation, to bring him glory and to be visible testimonies of his grace. Hallelujah. We're running out of time. Here's the closing prayer. Father, thank you for the but God intervention in our lives while spiritually dead. Help us live like the citizens of heaven we are because of our new lives in Christ. Please complete your work through us 
as we yield to the promptings and guidance of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, 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 hey. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Still I'm found Leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you gave yourself away Oh the overwhelming Never ending Reckless love of God Yeah may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Shalom. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Thank you for listening. And uh, if you like the broadcast, but please put likes on there. Share this with others so others can hear. If you have any prayer requests, uh, be, be, be sure to put them in the comments or send them through Messenger and I'll be glad to pray for your specific needs. Amen? Thank you for listening again. Bye.